coming up on the world today. Final evacuations resume after deadly Kabul airport explosion in Afghanistan. The UNHCR says half a million Afghans could flee across borders, describing the situation as catastrophic. Plus, 16 people killed in Pakistan after deadly chemical factory fire. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Layo Adegoke. Final evacuations have continued at Kabul airport following Thursday's bomb attack that killed at least 90 people and injured more than 150. Hospitals in Kabul, already struggling with fewer staff since the Taliban took power a week ago, have been overwhelmed with patients. Families are desperately searching for their loved ones who have gone missing, including children. U.S.-led evacuations from Kabul airport in Afghanistan enters its final stage following devastating twin bomb attacks on Thursday. The attacks targeted people queuing to flee the country after Taliban militants returned to power. This video shows crowds gathered outside the airport just before the blast. At least 90 people have been killed, mostly Afghan civilians and 13 U.S. military personnel. At least 150 people were also wounded. Hours earlier, Western governments had warned their citizens to stay away from the airport because of an imminent threat of an attack by ISK, the Afghanistan branch of the Islamic State group. U.S. President Joe Biden has promised to hunt down the perpetrators, jihadist group ISK. To those who carried out this attack, as well as anyone who wishes America harm, know this. We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. I will defend our interests and our people with every measure at my command. U.S. flags were lowered to half staff at the White House and on all public buildings and grounds to mark the death of the U.S. troops in the suicide bomb attack. The attack marked the first U.S. military casualties in Afghanistan since February 2020 and represented the deadliest incident for American troops in the country in a decade. The Taliban has condemned the attack but blames it on the presence of foreign troops. We condemn this attack, although I don't have the complete details, but targeting innocent uh, civilians is an act of terrorism that has to be condemned by the entire world. And uh, as soon as uh, the airport situation is figured out and the foreign forces leave, hopefully we will not have such attacks anymore. It is, again, uh, it is because of foreign forces, the presence of foreign forces, that such attacks take place. The evacuations and foreign troop withdrawals are designed to be completed by 31st of August, a deadline agreed with the Taliban. While the U.S. says it will stay till August 31st, the U.K. has announced it's in the final stages of its evacuation. On Thursday, several countries, including Germany, Spain, Canada and Australia, announced an end to their evacuation efforts. In total, around 12,500 people were evacuated on Thursday, raising the overall evacuees since the Taliban take over on 14th of August to over 105,000. Meanwhile, Kabul residents have held funerals for some of those who were killed in the deadly attack outside the airport. At hospitals, the injured are also being treated and anxious family members are seen checking on their loved ones. U.S. forces helping to evacuate Afghans desperate to flee Taliban rule are on alert for more attacks as the pace of the evacuation flights have also accelerated. VOA's Afghanistan and Pakistan Bureau Chief Aisha Tanzim joins us now from Islamabad. Aisha, you had to leave Kabul earlier this week. Just describe to us the situation there and what that experience was like for you. 
I mean, the scenes that you showed before the attack were exactly the scenes I experienced, which was thousands of people gathered around the airport, desperate to get inside, families, little children, women, old people, old women, old men. Some of the families were spending nights at the airport, not going home in the hope that they could get in at any hour of day and night. And I think uh, they thought once they got inside, they would be safe and they would be put on some evacuation flight to somewhere. Many of those families had maybe just one family member with a badge saying they'd served somewhere with NATO forces or the U.S. forces or the government, either you know in a province or in Kabul city. A lot of the family members without documents, without passports, just hoping that the badge would be their you know, um, pass to safety. Uh, so I saw a lot of desperation. I saw a lot of people crying and wailing. It was hot. It was sunny. People were getting dehydrated. They were drenched in sweat, you know, uh, in, uh, and at some gates. Uh, the forces inside were throwing water bottles outside, but a lot of people were there without food and water. Uh, nobody could take their luggage inside, so either very small bags or no bags at all. Um, it was not a, a, a good scene, and as we saw in that in the pictures you showed, a lot of people were standing in that sewage canal almost um, that was passing by the airport. So um, yes, desperate people trying to get inside, um, those are the people uh, who lost their lives. It's quite a heart-wrenching situation you're painting to us. Now, now to that deadly explosion that occurred yesterday. Do you know if this has deterred people from gathering outside the airport? The crowds outside the airport are obviously much less than they were before. And the other thing that we understand happened, and we had a reporter go there, uh, you know, late morning, was that the Taliban have expanded their security parameter. So previously they were just standing right outside the airport. Now they've expanded it further out and they've set up checkpoints. So they're not letting unauthorized vehicles pass through those checkpoints. So... Um, so those two things together and the fact that today there were rumors that another attack was imminent. Um, some people claimed that they'd received notices, unconfirmed rumors, but rumors nonetheless. So all of those things together uh, kept crowds away. Uh, but that does not mean that people weren't there. We've seen a lot of news stories saying that people are coming back. Um, uh, our reporter saw at least 15 or 16 buses headed toward the airport, toward the Taliban checkpoints outside the airport. We don't know whether those buses were allowed to go through or not because the Taliban have announced that they were, uh, and they did announce in their press conference two days ago that only foreigners, uh, people with a passport of another country, would be allowed to go to the airport, not Afghans. So we don't know whether the buses were allowed to go through, but we did spot the buses. All right, then. Thank you, Aisha, the VOA's Afghanistan and Pakistan Bureau Chief. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Meanwhile, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, says up to half a million Afghans could flee the crisis in their homeland, appealing to all neighboring countries to keep open their borders for those seeking safety. The UN Agency also says the humanitarian needs in the country are catastrophic. These are dramatic times, and UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, has worked with the people of Afghanistan for over 40 years, and we will stand by them and do what we can to support them. In terms of numbers, we are preparing for around 500,000 new refugees in the region. This is a worst case scenario. While we have not seen large outflows of Afghans at this point, the situation inside Afghanistan has evolved more rapidly than anyone expected. Security expert David Oto joins us now for more on the situation in Afghanistan. Thank you, David, for speaking to us. Just to get your thoughts on the events that have occurred over the past 24 hours, will America have reasons to return to Afghanistan to avenge the deaths of these American Marines? Well, I think, you know, we have to get away from uh, the reactive uh, measures, you know, talking about revenge. Uh, what is very clear from the past incident at the Kabul 
um, uh, uh, Ahamid Kazai uh, International Airport is that there was a clear evidence and there was clear intelligence which, you know, was presented, uh, which, you know, demonstrated that um, the Islamic State was planning an attack, uh, you know, just outside the um, perimeters of the Hamid Kaza airport, you know. So this was known. The targets were known. You know, the group was known. So, you know, something had to be done uh, to have stopped that. I don't think, uh, you know, America has any desire or the American public will have any desire for U.S. troops to go back to Afghanistan again to carry out any revenge attacks against um, the Islamic State. Now, what the U.S. has in terms of resources is to be able to sponsor some kind of a proxy whereby, you know, the perpetrators of this act, you know, may... Uh, be chased down or simply just, you know, um, assist the whatever Taliban government comes in power to be able to fight its rival, which is the Islamic State. But I don't think there is any desire, I don't think there is any public outcry for, you know, the U.S. to go back again to Afghanistan 9-11 style, you know, in order to revenge the death of, you know, Afghans and U.S. Marines. So um, that's where I think, you know, uh, we should be looking at a lot more um, a proactive, you know, uh, measures rather than, you know, looking at revenge strategies. Well, with this latest development, how likely or successful will the Taliban be in keeping its promise not to allow attacks on the U.S., you know, to emanate from Afghanistan again like they did 20 years ago? I think we've seen a very different Taliban from the one that um, was there before 9-11. You know, 20 years has gone by and the Taliban understands the, the capabilities uh, that the U.S. and NATO forces have in terms of uh, being able to destabilize, you know, the, the entire country. Um, they have made their promises, uh, even before now, that they will cut ties with Al-Qaeda. But that's a very, you know, big challenge. Uh, one is supposed to be able to see how that is going to work uh, for the simple reason that the Taliban cannot be distinguished from al Qaeda. You know, for the past 20 years, they've been fighting alongside a common enemy. They've also been very close to the Haqqani network, which also has links with neighboring Pakistan. And also, how are they going to be able to, you know, um, defeat the Islamic State? And what we know is that so many of the ex-Al Qaeda members, you know, are the ones who have formed um, you know, uh, the, the, the Islamic State of the Khorasan province, you know, and, and also they have some Taliban members within their group. So it's going to be very challenging. But I think the only way that the Taliban can succeed is if the international community, you know, finds a way of working with the Taliban regime to make sure that it has the right capacity and capability to deal with insurgency within its country so that the region and the entire, you know, global community can be safe. Without that, you know, there's trouble looming. Well, David, just very quickly in your assessment, just how much of a threat is this Islamic State, Khorasan province, the ISK? I mean, we've seen the disaster that it caused uh, at the uh, airport, you know, so that tells you, gives you an indication of how much of a threat that they pose. Um, ISIS, you know, the so-called Islamic State, you know, which the uh, again, the U.S. coalition said they had defeated in, uh, in, in the, the borders between Iraq and Mosul. They're still very powerful. They've got a branch in, in Nigeria, which is called the, the Islamic State of West Africa province. They have a branch in Mozambique. They've got a branch in Central Africa Republic, uh, uh, Central Africa in, in DRC Congo. So the, the Islamic State is a big threat. Uh, and the, they pose a very imminent threat, as we've seen in, in the case um, in, in Kabul. So they are, they are a group to reckon with, and I think the best way is for the global community to come together, including uh, whichever government comes out of Afghanistan. You know, they need to be helped in, in order for them to defeat um, the, the Islamic State. All right, then. Thank you so much. Security expert David Otto, thank you for your thoughts on the program. Thank you. Still to come on the program. Chileans enjoy rare snowfall in the desert of Atacama. More in a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. We're still on Afghanistan. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan says his government is in direct talks with the Taliban about helping run Kabul airport after the departure of international forces 
at the end of this month. President Erdogan says Turkish officials held talks with the Taliban for three and a half hours, suggesting the group is open to Turkey running the airport, but crucially with the Taliban in charge of its security. Turkey is a member of NATO and has been part of the alliance's forces in the country. It has secured the airport for the last six years. But the Taliban wants Turkish troops, along with all international forces, out. President Erdogan says despite the talks, there's no decision yet about maintaining a presence at the airport, warning of getting sucked in to a dangerous situation in light of Thursday's attacks. Away from Afghanistan, at least 20 people have died in the western Venezuelan state of Merida following intense rains that caused mudslides and rivers to overflow. State Governor Ramon Guevara says more than 1,200 houses had been destroyed and 17 people are still missing as rescue workers search the wreckage. Several towns in the affected area, including Tova and Santa Cruz de Mora, are without electricity as floodwaters damage transformers. Authorities say at least 54,543 people in 87 municipalities had been affected, in addition to damaged roads and bridges. U.S. Agency for International Development Administrator Samantha Power has announced $32 million in assistance to Haiti. The Caribbean country is reeling from an earthquake earlier this month that killed more than 2,000 people and destroyed or damaged tens of thousands of homes. As we build on this initial response, I am pleased here to announce. Pendant que nous continuons à bâtir sur la réponse initiale, ça, je suis très content pour m'annoncer aujourd'hui. That USAID will provide an additional 32 million dollars as part of a broader American response. Que USAID pourra le bail mettre sur côté 32 million dollars qui pourra faire partie d'une réponse plus à long terme du gouvernement de USAID et du gouvernement américain. To support people here affected by the earthquake. Pour supporter les gens qui sont affectés par le tremblement de terre. The Prime Minister and I spoke about the Haitian government's sense of the priorities of the people. Le Premier ministre Henry, avec moi, nous avons parlé de qui ce que le gouvernement haïtien a comme priorité pour aider les haïtiens. And how not only USAID and not only the entire US government but the broader international community can best meet those needs. At least 16 people have been killed in a factory fire in Pakistan's largest city and financial hub, Karachi. Police say the fire broke out at a multi-story chemical factory in the eastern part of the city and most windows of the factory were blocked. Many factory workers died after being trapped on the second floor in the fire which broke out on the ground floor of the three-story building. Over 260 workers were burnt alive when a multi-story garment factory was set on fire back in September 2012 in what became the deadliest industrial blaze in Pakistan's history. Blazes and accidents are common in South Asia's factories, many of which operate illegally and without proper fire safety measures. Some updates now from the COVID-19 pandemic. According to a new study, patients who had been hospitalized for coronavirus reported symptoms more than a year later. The study shows that one in three patients reported shortness of breath more than 12 months later, and that number went up among people who had fallen severely ill because of the virus. Here's more on this and other developments on our COVID-19 pandemic update. One of the largest studies yet in COVID found that some patients remained afflicted with either fatigue or shortness of breath more than a year after being hospitalized with the coronavirus. The Chinese study was published in the British medical journal, The Lancet. The study found that half of the patients still showed one symptom or another, most commonly fatigue or muscle weakness, a year on. Additionally, according to the study, women were 43% more likely than men to suffer from the symptoms. 
The New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has eased the tough nationwide lockdown measures, although businesses and schools will still be closed and the country's biggest city, Auckland, will remain shut for longer. Over the past 24 hours, health authorities reported 70 new cases. As you will have seen from today's case numbers reported earlier today, we may be seeing the beginning of a plateau in cases. Our job is to keep up the hard work in order to bend and then flatten that curve. We are doing really well and we have evidence that what we are doing is working, but caution is still required. Based on all the information in front of us and of the advice of Dr Bloomfield, Cabinet has decided that all of New Zealand south of the Auckland boundary will move to level 3 at 11.59pm on Tuesday, August 31. We'll review these settings at Cabinet a week later on Monday the 6th of September. In neighbouring Australia, the second most populous city, Sydney, has reported a slight fall in cases, but numbers still hover near record levels. New South Wales recorded 882 cases, most of them in the capital, Sydney, down from the record 1,029 on Thursday. And finally, according to projections by researchers at the University of Washington, the U.S. is set to record nearly 100,000 more COVID deaths by December. But going back to school has never been this complicated. But experts say the number can be cut in half if everyone wore a mask in public spaces. The current death toll from COVID in the United States stands at 730,000. Meanwhile, the number of coronavirus patients in U.S. hospitals has breached 100,000 on the highest level in eight months as a resurgence of COVID-19 spurred by the highly contagious Delta variant strains the nation's health care system. Well, a rare snowfall is surprising the residents of El Salvador, a small town located in the Chilean desert of Atacama. According to meteorologists, this phenomenon usually takes place every two or three years in June and July. Locals and motorists seize the opportunity to play with the snow and also build snowmen. And that's it on the program for today and for the week. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adegoki. Have a lovely weekend.